Hello and welcome to the first of a brand new series of CSF podcasts focusing specifically on psoriatic arthritis. We'll be bringing these new episodes on a bi-monthly basis and we'll be supplying you with monthly slide decks to help you keep up to date with the latest research and publications in the field of PSA. First of all, allow me to introduce myself and my co-hosts. I'm Laura Coates from the Nuffield Department of Orthopaedics, Rheumatology and Musculoskeletal Sciences at the University of Oxford. And today I'm joined by Enrique Soriano from the Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires. Christopher Richlin from the University of Rochester Medical Center, New York, and Frank Behrens from the Goethe University of Frankfurt. Frank and I are members of the CSF's new PSA Steering Committee, and we're really excited to be joining the wider CSF Steering Committee. If you want to find out more about us, our bios have now been added to the faculty page of the CSF website. Head over to cytokinesignaling.com and take a look. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'm very excited about this first uh, PSA podcast of CSF. Um, today we will be discussing three uh, papers um, that uh, are covering a wide range of topics from drug survival to uh, in patients with chronic inflammatory conditions to drug safety profiles in, uh, of JAK inhibitors and the impact of IL-17 inhibitors in atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. Our first paper that will be discussed by Chris Ritling highlights drug survival across four different chronic inflammatory conditions in the real world. And as you probably all know, drug survival is used as a proxy measure of uh, drug effectiveness. And uh, in this study, Egerberg and collaborators using a large national wide cohort in Denmark analyzed drug survival of biologics and new small molecules in rheumatoid arthritis, axial spondyl arthritis, um, psoriatic arthritis, and psoriasis. In the second paper that will be discussed by Frank Burns. Uh, their master and collaborators look at the safety profile of upadacitinib um, using pool data from two well-known randomized controlled trials, the SELECT PSA1 and 2, and compare 15 and 30 milligrams of upadacitinib with adalimumab and uh, placebo in patients with psoriatic arthritis with inadequate response to one or more uh, non-biologic or biologic um, uh, DMARs. And finally, Laura Coates will analyze the research by Merola and collaborators who study the impact of the IL-17 inhibitor secukinumab on cardiovascular risk in patients with psoriatic arthritis, axial spondyl arthritis, and psoriasis. Um, this investigator um, using this in this post hoc analysis uh, using pool data from phase three and four randomized controlled trials in each one of these uh, different diseases, uh, not only look at the inflammatory biomarkers known to be associated with atherosclerosis risk, but also um, conventional risk factors. So without further delay, um, I will please, Chris, if you can tell us a little bit about this uh, study on drug survival. So thank you, Enrique. In the first paper entitled Drug Survival of Biologics and Novel Immunomodulators for RA Axial Spa PSA and Psoriasis, a nation cohort study from the Dan Bio and Derm Bio registries. So studies have suggested that biologics and JAK inhibitors may lose their effectiveness over the long term. So this study examined real life drug survival with Kaplan-Meier Kaplan survival curves and Cox proportional hazards modeling. And they wanted to determine the probability that patients will remain on a given drug of biologics and novel small molecule therapies across RA, XPA, PSA, and psoriasis using data from these two larger well-known registries. 
The study comprised of over 12,000 uh, patients, including over 5,000 RA, 2,100 AXPA, over 2,500 PSA, and over 2,500 psoriasis patients. Among patients retrieving, receiving treatment for PSA, the most frequently used therapy was adalimumab, 40%, followed by infliximab, 34%, and etanercept, 25%. Drug survival was generally highest among patients treated with either adalimumab, ixekizumab, or secukinumab. In confounder adjusted models, tofacitinib and infliximab had the lowest drug survival compared to the other drugs. All other drugs performed almost equally well. There was a tendency though for a generally higher drug survivor survival for golimumab followed by secukinumab and ixekizumab. For the other inflammatory conditions studied, highest drug survival in confounder-adjusted models is shown by RA, where rituximab, baricitinib, etanercept, and tocilumumab, respectively. For AXPA, golimumab, secukinumab, and etanercept, respectively. And for psoriasis, guselkimab. So in conclusion, in PSA, Golimumab and secukinumab had the highest drug survival, followed by ixekizumab. Individualized approaches to the treatment of chronic inflammatory disease are required, consistent with the underlying disease, patient profile, and treatment history. I thought this was an interesting nationwide cohort study, but how generalizable these results are to other countries, I think, is very open to question because in Denmark, they have a very strict mandatory registry as to what drugs a patient can get, uh, receive. And I think this may not be generalizable, certainly to the United States. And the other component that's mentioned as a weakness is that there were many demographic variables that they were unable to bring into their models because of incomplete data capture. Many of these are demographic factors, financial issues that would influence drug choices. Nonetheless, I think it is helpful for us to see that in PSA, uh, the, the agents in anti-TNF and 17 uh, had the highest drug survival and that uh, adalimumab and secukinumab were both highly prescribed as well, which is, I think, very true, at least in the United States. And I'm interested in my colleagues on this forum, if that's the same in their countries as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we have similar restrictions in terms of access to medications depends a little bit where you live in the UK. And obviously there are going to be differences between these different groups, aren't they? And whether you're getting your drug first line or fourth line, um, what comorbidities and other issues you have. So there is some kind of channeling bias coming into any of these registry data. Mm -hmm. but, but we have to use registry data for this kind of long-term follow-up. And the advantage is that they are very inclusive. So we do get nearly every patient starting on biologics going into these registries and it will include patients who have lots of comorbidities and um, maybe wouldn't be eligible for trials. So I think it's really important data. I suspect there is some impact of some of the drugs that are used first or second line coming out slightly better uh, rather than some of those drugs that are used more, you know, fourth, fifth line uh, that wouldn't be our first choices. Uh, and I'm sure that has some impact. But I think, like you say, it's positive data both for TNFs and 17s, which are probably the most commonly used drugs for us here in the UK as well. Agreed. Yeah, and no, I think uh, drug survival is summing up a little bit both efficacy and safety normally. I think uh, these are the two reasons why to stop a, a, a treatment, either with uh, due to intolerance or to loss of efficacy or uh, inadequate response overall. But um, I think sometimes you get surprising results from these kind of drug survival studies. I remember in the past when we saw that ustekinumab based on a, let's say, slightly lower overall effectiveness and efficacy seems to be very yeah, well, well received and well accepted by the patients, uh, maybe due to the safety profile and, and run smoothly over time. Uh, so which means sometimes in this drug survival, you see as soon as someone is a responder on a drug, maybe the safety is then the driving driving uh, uh, category uh, for, for drug survival. It might affect that maybe the overall response rate might be lower uh, and the probability to be responder might be lower. But I think important additional data um, beyond the randomized clinical trials, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I, I also agree. I think that something that um, I think concerns me a little bit is when you look at these studies and you look at the end of the study, the overall, the drug survival after three or four or five years is less than 50% or 40%. And that means, and we see that on our uh, practice, that um, after a while you start switching patients, um, uh, switching drugs. Um, so I think that is uh, something that uh, we need to do is try to um, do something to uh, keep patients on uh, the drug for longer period because it's not after a while in young patients, you are running out of options. So I think it's something that we, we need to work a little bit more on uh, looking for drug, uh, improving drug survival when we treat our patients. Yeah, and then I think we are we're going forward to our second paper. So, um, yeah, now I'm in the situation to report to you normally what is reported only in a short paragraph in the in the uh, primary manuscript of a, of a randomized clinical trial. It's a safety. And uh, I think we discussed already that uh, adherence and drug survival might be also driven by by safety and uh, specifically in those drugs who were um, recently approved for an indication, it is important to um, sum up the data we have on safety. So this is a manuscript from Gerd Burmeister from Berlin, um, a, a colleague here from the Charité. Um, and the title of the paper is Safety Profile of Upatacitinib Up to Three Years in Psoriatic Arthritis, an Integrated Analysis of Two Pivotal Phase Three Trials. So, um, I think Enrique, you have pointed already out, there are two studies, select PSA and one, uh, PSA one and two uh, for PSA. And this analyzes described the safety profile of UPA 15 milligram and 30 milligram once daily for up to three years of exposure in patients with active PSA who had a prior inadequate response or intolerance to at least one non-biologic or biologic DMARC. So, um, and if you sum it up, you will result in a number of 2,257 patients received at least one dose of upatacitinib 15 or 30 milligrams for 2,504 patient years of exposure or adalimumab. And that's the interesting thing. You have a comparator arm in, in one of these trials, um, and this will uh, result in 549.7 patient years. But keep in mind, there's a huge differences in numbers, 2,504 patient years for UPA and 549.7 patient years for Adalimumab. So the most common treatment emergent adverse uh, events with UPA were upper respiratory tract infections, nasopharyngitis, and increased of CPK. So the rates of malignancies, adjudicated maces and uh, venous thromboembolic events and deaths are similar across all the treatment groups, all treatment groups, including two doses of UPA, adalimumab, and uh, placebo. So um, interesting and maybe expected rates of herpesosis and opportunistic infections, um, excluding tuberculosis, herpes, and oral candidiasis were numerically higher with upatacitinib compared to adalimumab. So let's look shortly to the absolute numbers. So we have in the herpes zoster rate, 6.7 events per 100 patient years for U per 30. Keep in mind, it's only licensed in 15 milligram for the PSA and in 15 milligrams U per, it's 3.8 per 100 patient years herpes zoster events uh, compared to 0.5 or 2.2 for adalimumab uh, and placebo. Which means interestingly, the 0.5 in adalimumab is much lower than the 2.2 for placebo. So all the other opportunistic infections, as mentioned earlier, were comparable to all the treatment groups. Let's look for serious infections. So let's focus on those adverse reactions we are interested in uh, as, as treating physicians. Um, serious infections were seen in 5.2 events per 100 patient years in UPA 30, 2.3 per 100 patient years for UPA 15, 1.3 for adalimumab and 1.9 per 100 patient years for, for placebo. So I, I mentioned already that CPK elevation seems to be in the trend uh, more often 
uh, in, in the UPAR arm, but uh, again, keep in mind, it's only licensed for 15 milligrams, so 9.1 events per 100 patient years for UPAR 15, 13.8 for 30 milligram UPAR, and 7.5 per 100 patient years for ADA and 4.1 events uh, for um, placebo. So interestingly, the rates for adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation were similar across all uh, treatments groups. And um, when you look to the, to the manuscript, more than 90% of the, of the herpes zoster infections were non-serious. Um, maybe this is also an important event. And I think um, the herpes zoster events were mostly seen in the oldest, uh, above 60 and in the Asian uh, patients included. I think this is what we have uh, already learned from RA trials and other trials and trials from other uh, CHAC inhibitors, but overall, I think this is an important um, result for these, um, for these um, summary of the safety events we see in these two phase three clinical trials. Um, and I think um, the take home message for me at least is uh, you have to vaccinate your people. Um, and and um, I think I'm always happy to recognize potential adverse reactions uh, where I can, can, can prevent the patients by doing something like, as I mentioned, vaccination, I think. And that's not too different. And overall, there were new, no, no new safety events. Um, so uh, it's within the expected range. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I don't know whether, whether um, this might have some direct impact. I think, again, 15 milligram is only uh, approved uh, for treating PSA and, and yeah, I think, uh, Laura, what's your opinion on the safety data? Do you think there's a huge disadvantage or do you see it's, it's comparable to other Limumab, at least with a 15? Yeah, I think it looks about comparable, doesn't it? And, and we would expect the data to show what it showed, really. I don't think it was any big surprises. Um, like you say, if there are adverse events that we can prevent, then we should be doing that. Um, that's not always straightforward. We sometimes struggle with licenses and who will do the vaccine and whether we can get it in primary care or secondary care. Um, but I think it's clearly important for those patients that we're thinking about JAK inhibitors. And obviously the bigger question is around long-term safety and rarer events in longer term trials, um, as we've seen um, done for tofacitinib, but that will take time. You know, we're not gonna get that kind of data from phase three trials. So I suspect there's still a bit of caution around the use of JAK inhibitors, particularly in patients who are older and have high cardiovascular risk. But at least for now, this is reassuring data. And then we wait and see what comes from longer term studies. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I also agree. I think it's important to have these data, but uh, still we, we need longer follow-ups and uh, probably real-world data. But yeah, and I think that the other big question that might be Chris want to uh, say something about is whether we should uh, take all the JAK inhibitors as a class or there might be differences uh, between some of them, um, something that I think is still on debate. Frank, you mentioned that uh, in herpes zoster and opportunity infections were more prevalent in the older patients. How about the other adverse events? Were they also more prevalent in the older patients? Though all the other, um, all the other events, um, with exception of CPK, were equally distributed to, to all these treatment arms. So there was no difference and no clear hint to the, to the ages. I think in CPK, again, it's also distributed and not only in the older one, but this is a significant difference, but mainly in the 30 milligram but not in the 15. Yeah, yeah, because the oral surveillance study gave us a lot of insight into a certain population and certainly age yeah. is a major component there. But I think we're, we're still waiting to see these safety data unveiled over time to get a better sense as Enrique mentioned of whether or not this is across the class or not so much. And I don't think we know yet. Yeah, I, I think the herpes zoster, I think this is in, an adverse reaction we can expect based on the mode of action and the impact on antiviral uh, uh, immune function by uh, affecting interferons and IL-15 and others. I think this can be explained by mode of action in comparison to a pure TNF inhibitor, I think, but, but you're right. I think the long-term 
safety data is is what is crucial i think um, and let's let's wait um, but overall i think as you pointed out chris i think we can identify potential at risk population for this kind of mode of actions and i think if we have alternatives in those who are heavy smokers uh, obese uh, older um, having already a cardiovascular events i think then we maybe prefer to have a biological therapy with a single cytokine kind inhibition compared to a broader intracellular remote of action, I think. Cool. So if we move on to our last paper, then the last of the three papers that we were going to look at today is looking at the effect of secukinumab on traditional cardiovascular risk factors and inflammatory biomarkers. And this, again, is using a post hoc analysis of pooled studies. So I guess it links in quite nicely um, from that discussion about safety. So we know that PSA, XBAR and psoriasis are all associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, and so the aim of this study was to pool data from phase three and phase four trials across those three different conditions and look at the effect of secukinumab on cardiovascular risk factors over the period of a year. And they looked really at kind of two groups of risk factors. So they looked at traditional cardiovascular risk factors like BMI and cholesterol. But then they also looked at some more novel and I guess more inflammatory related risk factors. So a high sensitivity CRP, um, which I guess is really not surprising. Most people will be aware of the link between inflammation and cardiovascular disease, but also the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio which is a more novel measure. Um, it's been identified in non-inflammatory disease cohorts, so in the normal population um, in cardiovascular studies as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, and those inflammatory markers are predictive both of developing cardiovascular disease and of death related to that. So in this analysis, they took just over 9,000 patients from 19 different clinical trials. So there were five clinical trials in PSA, eight in psoriasis, and six in AXPAR, with the majority of the patients being psoriasis patients, um, nearly 5,000, um, but sort of 4,000 or more um, with spondyloarthritis as well. And over the follow-up in these uh, studies, they found that the tr traditional cardiovascular risk factors, um, BMI, for example, remained quite stable over the course of a year. So no better and no worse. Um, but again, perhaps um, unsurprisingly, we, we did reassuringly see a reduction in high sensitivity CRP uh, related to secukinumab treatment. And that was seen both in the spondyloarthritis group and in the psoriasis group uh, with a much greater reduction compared to placebo, either at week 12 or week 16. Uh, and with this newer measure, this neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, uh, again, which is linked to inflammation, they saw a similar um, rapid reduction in that uh, NLR, uh, both at week 12 and week 16 compared to placebo in either the spondyloarthritis or the psoriasis trials. Uh, and that similar level of reduction was seen in the overall population, but also, I guess, even more importantly, in patients who were high risks to, to start with. So the sort of patients that you would worry about going on to develop further cardiovascular disease. And it seemed to be well maintained over the year um, treatment with secukinumab. So in summary, we've seen this reduction of the more inflammatory related risk factors like high sensitivity CRP and the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, but no difference in terms of traditional cardiovascular risk factors that we would see in patients with psoriasis, PSA and AXPAR. So, I mean, obviously we see a lot of this in psoriatic arthritis that, you know, patients live with psoriatic arthritis but they tend to really suffer with significant cardiovascular disease. Uh, and it's a common cause of death in this group, in the psoriasis and the spa group. So it's really important that we're thinking about how our treatments impact on that and, and whether that might influence our choices in terms of therapy. Um, it seems that there's much more to do in terms of the traditional cardiovascular risk factors though. So 
even if we're getting people's inflammation better controlled, we need to be looking at additional impacts. So um, reducing weight, maintaining a healthy body weight, regular exercise, stopping smoking, um, the, the kind of usual healthy lifestyle issues, and probably uh, ensuring that we've got good or better control of blood pressure and diabetes and other related diseases. So I think it, it's certainly really interesting information to have to start with. It, the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio was not something I was aware of um, in terms of cardiovascular li literature before, um, and maybe provides further evidence that treating inflammation is doing more than just improving people's pain and joint swelling. Yeah, well, I think thoughts? the important information would be what kind of treatment choice is the best one. So is there any differences by what mode of action you are controlling the inflammation, whether it's more TNF uh, um, or more IL-17 or 23 or whatever, which um, is a better choice if both, if all of these treatment options were able to control inflammation, uh, but is there any difference in mode of actions? Um, I think we can't answer this question right now, but I think um, the important message you pointed out is that we have to take care about all the risk factors and not only controlling inflammation. I think Eula has stated clearly that we as rheumatologists are responsible in managing uh, risk factors, cardiovascular risk factors. It doesn't mean that we have to take to, to treat all of them, but we have to manage it and take care about it. I think that's the important message to normalize mortality in our psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis patients. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Frank and, and Laura. I think you mentioned, Laura, at the end that controlling the other risk factors is really so important, many of which are in, under the control of the patient. Uh, but we do want to know if there is an additional benefit to a specific biologic class in decreasing cardiovascular risk. It'd be something we may want to think about in addition to doing those very important interventions that you mentioned. And uh, clearly, in order to answer that question, they're going to need a longer study with IL-17 blockade and probably some different endpoints uh, that might give you more insight into what's really happening. Uh, but you know, the fact that two surrogate measures are going down uh, is uh, is encouraging. We'll have to see more later on, right? Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I also was a little bit impressed. And also, well, I, I look at it as um, a new uh, thing to look at, uh, this new uh, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, because I think that as happening there in the trials, and I think it's what happens in our clinical practice, not around 25% or so of our patients have um, elevated CRP. So uh, I don't know how that works in patients with normal CRP. So I think that this new marker is something to look at. Um, also, we might be able to look at what is the effect of the other drugs that was mentioned on this new biomarker. But I, I agree, we need to, to look for the hard outcomes in the long term, but I think that some um, uh, cohorts and, and registries will be able to, to tell us more about that. But I think it's it's uh, this cardiovascular issue is, is, is very important, and we are paying more and more attention of the conventional risk factors in our patients. So great, I think that was good. Thank you, Chris, Laura, Chris, Frank. I think it was a great discussion. And thank you all for joining us uh, for this inaugural psoriatic arthritis podcast brought to you by CSF. Um, we really hope you enjoy it. And if you really did, do not forget to subscribe to our channels on YouTube, SoundCloud, or I cannot mention anymore, but uh, maybe you, you can, um, do whatever you get your podcast from. Uh, so you don't miss our future episodes that as Laura mentioned, we'll have uh, one episode every two months. Um, uh, and also if you want to read a little bit more about what we have discussed today, um, head over uh, csf.com where you will find uh, detailed uh, summary slides of each one of these uh, papers that we discussed today. So again, thank you, you all, and see you soon. Bye.